you're here this morning. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 this morning. And thank you for coming to First Baptist Church. And I'm excited about what God has for us in the next chapter in our series in the book of Acts. It never ceases to amaze me as I study for uh, these sermons how God is moving, not only in, as we see in Acts, but here in this, in this town, First Baptist Church. And uh, not just in this church, in many good churches in the area. And I'm so glad, I'm always encouraged and so glad that God is not just a God who used to work. I'm glad that as I look in the book of Acts, I don't just get to read about what God did and read about it in a historical sense and think like, wow, I, I sure wish God would, would touch someone today because he is. He is. And I'm glad that I don't just get to read the book of Acts and think, boy, I wish God would save somebody again because he still is saving people. And the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus Christ is still working in hearts and lives of people. I'm talking about people who are elderly in their years and people who are young. Old and young, whether you're rich or poor or famous or common, doesn't matter. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ still works. And God is still working in 2024. And I'm glad he is. But in Acts chapter 8, We'll look in this first few verses. We're going to see in this chapter, if we take the whole time, three major threads that kind of weave in and out of this chapter. Uh, three major thoughts, groups of thoughts, that kind of seem to be just disjointed, but I believe upon further examination, they're all tied together. They're knit together because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ has a way of taking people, and circumstances and situations, all various and diverse, and weaving them together. You can look no further than this room and see what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. As we look around this room, we're all different. We look different, you sing different, you smell different, you work different, we're all different. Some tall, some short, some smart. I'm not going there. But the gospel weaves us together, does it not? And these three threads in this chapter are woven together because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, please, let's just look at these first uh, five verses, and then we'll just begin the introduction in this way. And the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Now, that was the death of Stephen the martyr. We just ended chapter 7 where Stephen was stoned because of his faith and because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Saul, who will later become the apostle Paul, but this is Saul at this point, Saul was there, all right, and he was consenting. He approved of the death of Stephen the martyr. The Bible goes on to say this, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preach Christ unto them. In this chapter, uh, we kind of have the whole synopsis of the chapter kind of bound up in these first five verses in some way. What we find is that in these chapters, we find out that we have a persecution of the church and a scattering of the saints. All right, and, and Saul at this point, who would later become the apostle Paul, Saul was going house to house and making inquisition, are you a Christian? Are you a follower of the way, the way of Jesus? And if they were known to be a Christian, or if they affirmed that fact, he would then lock them up in prison. We find out later on that he's, he's doing this by order and approval of all of the religious leaders. In fact, they've given him letters of commendation and to make his journey easy so that when he goes to a different city, they say that what Saul does is under the approval of the, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. All right, so Saul is, is persecuting the believers, the true Christians, and they're scattered. Later on in the chapter, beginning in verse number 9, we're going we're gonna to learn about a man named Simon the sorcerer. 
who is witnessed to by Simon Peter. In fact, in these first few verses, we find out that many Christians were scattered, but the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And Simon was a result of the gospel in Jerusalem. And then in these first five verses, we find out in verse 5 that Philip, who we have often affectionately referred to as Philip the Evangelist, he will go preach the gospel everywhere he goes. In fact, he'll uh, have a a conversation with an Ethiopian leader, Ethiopian eunuch, In fact, there are accounts that the church, the Christian church in Ethiopia can be traced back to this particular individual out of Acts chapter 8. And God uses Philip in a unique and an amazing way and and puts him right in the place that God wants him to be. Reminds me just a couple things to begin the message that number one, you cannot defeat the gospel. You can't. You and I cannot defeat the gospel. The government cannot defeat the gospel. Some reigning dictator or monarch cannot defeat the gospel. Another religion cannot defeat the gospel. But as we come to Simon, we we learn this lesson. You better not mistreat the gospel. We mistreat the gospel to our own reproach and to our own embarrassment and shame. And I look at Philip and I say, you know what? We We must always be ready to repeat the gospel. We find out through the the entire chapter that Philip is preaching the gospel. And he never seemed to complain that he got to say it again. He never seemed to say, boy, this is the same thing I'm saying over and over, the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, we must be ready to repeat the gospel. Or we can say it this way. When we're battered, believe the word. There are Christians who were persecuted, they were battered, and they believed in Jesus. When you're scattered, preach the word. God may call you to a strange place where you may even not want to go on your own, but where you're scattered, preach the word. When you're battered, believe the word. Because what really matters is the word. Throughout this chapter, we find out that the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is powerful. This morning, I'd like to deal with just one thread in this chapter. We could deal with all three, but we'd be here through the next time change a year from now. And I figure at some point you're going to want to go eat lunch. So we're going to just pick one thread this morning. And the one I'd like to deal with is one that's a little more controversial. Some verses here that have caused some angst and some issue. And that's specifically with the conversion or the supposed conversion of a man named Simon. Simon the sorcerer. We're going to look at these verses and see what is happening here because there's some some details to this account that are kind kind of hard to process at first. What's going on with this man and how does he end up in such a terrible place? You know, anytime that God sends revival, anytime that God begins to work, Satan sends a counterfeit. Anytime you have church growth, Satan will try to artificially have church growth. Anytime that you have a rule from God, Satan will counterfeit and and undermine that. And that theme will be found throughout the entire Bible that what God is doing, Satan is trying to undermine in any way, in any form, in any fashion that he can. And here in the story of Simon, the account of Simon in Acts chapter 8, I believe we're going to find a situation where there is another opposing force going on. And there's some things that happen that with some clarity I think will help us this morning. So that's the Lord's blessing, and we'll jump into the middle of this chapter. Lord, we love you. Lord, I'm thankful that we can be here this morning. And Lord, I pray that as we look at this portion of Scripture that you would illuminate this truth in our hearts, in our spirit. Lord, you would pull back the veil of confusion and that clearly we would see the truth for us this morning. And that we would take it to heart and respond to it the right way. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning who does not know you as Savior, that they would call upon your name today for forgiveness of sins and repentance. And we know that you will save them if they do that. So Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. We're thankful that we can meet together. Lord, we ask you to do something that will be eternal in nature and value today. So the long past, remember what, uh, or who said what this morning, Lord, remember what was said in the truth from your word. Lord Jesus' name I ask. Amen. If you look in Acts chapter 8, we're going to begin in just a moment in verse number 9. 
9 to about, I think it's verse about 22, and we have this account of Simon the Great, Simon the Sorcerer. In fact, in this account, there's going to be two Simons. We have Simon Peter and Simon the Great, or in Greek it would be Simon Magnus and Simon Petra. And we'll have kind of a a standoff, a face-off between Simon the Great and Simon Peter, Simon the Rock. One that will be filled with himself and one that is filled with God. And they have two entirely different thoughts, two entirely different belief systems, two entirely different philosophies. And even though they appear to be similar, the Bible reveals to us that they could not be further apart. Anytime that God sends revival, Satan sends a counterfeit. And things that appear to be similar can actually be miles apart. We must be on guard for those things that appear to be close but are actually miles apart. Listen, there are false teachers all around us. There are false teachers on TV. There are false teachers on YouTube. And we must look to the Word of God. And Simon Peter, the right Simon, the one who has the the way and the wisdom of God, will bring God's way. That's how you know the difference. That's how you know the difference. When someone is just on their own way and appeals to your own way, you can almost categorically mark them off as a false teacher. Listen, God wants to bring you all the prosperity in the world. Mark them off as a false teacher. God does not just want to bring you prosperity in the world. Now, let's be, to tell you more here, does God bless some Christians with prosperity? You better believe it. Read your Bible. Look at Abraham, who was extremely wealthy. Look at Job, extremely wealthy. But God's main point in life is not to make you wealthy with riches. But God's main point is to make you wealthy with eternal riches. And they look different. That means sometimes you're battered and sometimes you're scattered. But what really matters is the word. So let's look, please, as we read this account beginning in verse number 9 of Acts chapter 8. The Bible says, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Pause there real quick. Look up here if you wouldn't mind. What Simon was doing was so moving and so deceiving that the masses, from the small to the great, thought it was what God was doing. Right? This was not just some sleight of hand card trick. This was not just some uh, smoke and mirrors make the New York uh, Empire State Building disappear. Something was going on here. The power, not of God but was so captivating that people said it was of God. And we know from Scripture who can appear as an angel of light. It's Satan himself. And Simon the sorcerer, Simon the Great, was revered. Simon the Great was reverenced by the masses. And they said, this Simon, what he does must be from the power of God. Let's look at what happens, though. In verse 11, and to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then look particularly hard at verse number 13, where the Bible says, then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now this verse we're going to come back to in a few moments because if the Bible were to stop there, this would be an incredible account. The incredible account of Simon the sorcerer, Simon who was no doubt touched by some type of other force, 
supernatural force, not of God, not of God. And the Bible says here that he believed and was baptized. Now the Bible has said that before about other people in Acts. It'll say it about the, the day of Pentecost. They believed and were baptized. It'll say afterwards about, about after the man was healed at the gate called beautiful. And it says it again about Simon. And if the Bible stopped there in the account, we would walk away thinking, and perhaps understanding rightfully so at that point, that Simon was a true convert. But the Bible doesn't stop there. The Bible continues, uh, not in error, doesn't contradict itself, just takes us some look, looking at what is going on here. So he, he, the Bible says he believed and was baptized. He made an outward profession. And then he watched Philip and wondered about the miracles and signs. Verse 14. Now when the po apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now this is not something that happens today. All right, you do not, now if you could say, you do not have to have someone pray over you to receive the Holy Ghost. Now when you're saved, the Holy Ghost comes and is imparted upon you instantly. But in this time of transition in the church, God worked a little bit differently in the book of Acts. And the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, was specifically, all right, demonstrated on true conversions. All right, authenticating that God was in this. Doesn't happen that way now. The moment someone trusts Christ, boom, Holy Spirit comes and resides in us. We have the power of God. But as many as receive them, to them give you the power of God. All right, so this point received it, but then Peter and John came down. Verse 17, then laid they hands, their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And we notice in verse 18 that Simon has not had this happen yet. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. How much does the Holy Ghost cost? wonder how much Simon offered that day. How much would you pay for the power of God? I'll tell you right now, the short answer, you don't have enough. You don't make enough. You will never make enough. I don't care what your last name is. Bezos, Musk, it doesn't matter. You don't make, no one can make enough to buy the power of God. Everything we have is like filthy rags next to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The only way to receive the power of God is through Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. So you can put your Franklins away and your Jacksons away. There's no other name. It's only Jesus Christ. But Simon offers him money. Now, I don't know what, what you do when you read your Bible, but when I read my Bible, sometimes my mind like, takes a little exit ramp. All right? And it's not a problem. It's not a problem. And I put myself there for a moment, and I imagine myself being Simon Peter talking to Simon Magnus, Simon the Sorcerer. And I wonder how the money conversation kind of went down at first. Now, we know the end of the conversation, but how did it go on at first? Did Simon Magnus, all right, the Sorcerer, go to Simon Peter? Hey, hey, Simon, can I, can I talk to you real quick, just you and me alone? Yes? Listen. That little thing you do, that little laying on of hands, what does it cost? In a moment of disbelief, probably? No, 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 no. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, I'm good for it. I'm Simon Magnus. <laughs> a lot of people know about me. I'm a, I'm a pretty big deal. Small to great. I've been at this a long, long time. I've got quite a, you know. So, so, so name me your price. A million? Two million? Hey, listen, listen. I mean, we, 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 are, we, are we communicating here? Simon Peter, looking in complete shock and shame at this man who thought he could buy the power of God. And my friends, there's only one way to receive the power of God. That's through Jesus Christ. And by this question, we begin to see inside of Simon's heart. 
want to give you a couple thoughts, and we're going to finish what happens with some truths for us. But notice as we look at, at the wickedness of Simon, that the Bible tells us that he was a magician. He was a sorcerer. All right, he was known and his ways were settled. He outwardly professed, but he sought with money that which only God can do. You know what he wanted? He wanted the magic of God. That's what he wanted. And my friends, God is not a magic show. All right, he wanted the fame of God, but God is not in it just to give you fame. He wanted these things. He wanted, he craved the, the power of God for his own purposes for his own pleasure, and for his own promotion. I read a story this morning about Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, often called the Prince of Preachers. He began to preach at the age of 16. And at 25, his church built a 5,000-seat auditorium. At 25, that was filled overflowing every single week. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who who spoke one time over 20,000 people at one time. And they could hear him. No sound system. There's another man who was also alive at the same time that Charles Spurgeon was alive. And his name was P.T. Barnum. And P.T. Barnum, do you remember what he was famous for? The circus. The story that I read said that P.T. Barnum wrote to Charles Spurgeon. And he wrote this way. He sent him a telegram and offered him a large sum of money to come and preach in the circus tents and charge admission. And Charles Spurgeon sent a telegram back, a short reply. Dear Mr. Barnum, you will find my answer in Acts 8, verse 20. You can look there in the scripture, we'll look there in just a moment. <laughs> All right that Charles Spurgeon understood what Simon Magnus, what Simon the Sorcerer didn't understand, was that you cannot buy the power of God. You don't have enough money. You won't make enough money. You aren't worth enough money. That what God sends is truly genuine, and what Satan wants to do is truly counterfeit. In verse number 20, we find the wisdom of Peter. Peter says this in verse number 20. Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Now, I wonder what P.T. Barnum thought when he looked up that verse. (laughs) Pretty stout answer. But Simon Peter says to Simon the Great, thy money perish with thee. Notice how Simon Peter instantly goes to the heart of the issue, and he says, Simon, you're going to perish That word perish has the idea not of just a waste away, but of eternal perishing. Now remember in verse number 13, it said that Simon the Great, he believed and was baptized. I thought he was saved. And here Simon Peter, under divine revelation from God, says, your money is going to perish with you. Notice what he continues to say. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Let me give you the first truth this morning that I want you to just grab and hold on to. Number one is this. Head knowledge is dead knowledge. Head knowledge is dead knowledge. Peter tells us very plainly right here to Simon Peter, to Simon the Great, listen, you have said this thing, but your heart, your heart is not right. Your heart didn't believe in God. Your heart wasn't transformed. Your head believed it, and your actions tried to fake it till you make it, but your heart is not right with God. You see, a head knowledge is a dead knowledge. And there are people who profess to be Christians who have all the head knowledge. They can tell you the stories of the Bible, the well-known and the lesser-known stories. They can find any random book and passage. They can flip to Habakkuk quicker than anyone else. But unfortunately, it's not a heart knowledge or a heart belief. It's merely a head knowledge. And a head knowledge is a dead knowledge. And Simon the Great had a head knowledge right here. He had believed, like, wow, this is neat, this is great, and I'll get baptized. But Peter clearly, Simon Peter clearly says, listen, your heart is not touched by the gospel. Your heart is going to perish because you merely have knowledge up here. And what a warning to all of us that though we come to church, perhaps even faithfully, 
And though we bring our Bible, perhaps even faithfully, and though we've been baptized, perhaps even right here, be sure that what we have is not merely a head knowledge, but a heart transformation. God doesn't want you just to know about him. God wants you and I to know him right here. God doesn't want you just to get wet in the baptistry, but God wants you out of a genuine response to faith in him to outwardly proclaim, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. Not just with my head, but from the depths of my soul and spirit. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I fear that too often we fake around with merely a head knowledge. We raise our young people in an environment of external religion where performance is everything. And listen, God does care how we look and how we act. God does care about that. But he cares most about your heart. These things on the outside, the baptism, and the way we live and the way we act and the way we speak, is not just something we clothe ourselves in, but something that ought to come from inside out. Martin Luther, father of the Reformation, said this, that we are saved by faith alone, but, he finished the statement, but faith never shows up alone. And that's what James says in James chapter 2. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, what we do ought to flow from a heart transformation because head knowledge is dead knowledge. And you can learn every verse in the whole Bible and still go straight to hell if it only stops right here. And you can go to heaven knowing just one truth that Jesus Christ died for you. That was the thief on the cross and he believed in Jesus Christ and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You see, head knowledge is dead knowledge when Peter continues in this account. Verse 22 Repent, therefore, of this, thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Number two, and I love that God included this in the account, you can come back. You can turn back. You can come home. Simon Peter says to Simon the Great, listen, your heart is not right, but... But repent and pray if God will, will make this right. This thread is found throughout the scripture that God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. The thought that God eagerly waits for people to come to him, that he seeks after people, that he wants us to turn back to him. God is not looking to knock you over the head with a spiritual two by four. God wants you to turn back to him in repentance, biblical repentance. The Bible says, him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. That's what Jesus said. So I just have to believe that if Simon the sorcerer had turned back to God, that Jesus' words would have come true. That if he had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he would have been saved. And my friends, no matter how far, you can turn back. What a blessing. Because you know what? We blow it. We mess up. We make mistakes. And the devil whispers in our ears, you know what? You've gone too far. You've made too much of a mess. You can't be used. God won't take you. And my friends, that is not of God. God's cry is for forgiveness. God's heartbeat is is for restoration. And I'm so glad that you can turn back, that I can come back. God wants to pour out his mercy. God wants to demonstrate compassion. And head knowledge is dead knowledge, but you can turn back. But number three, look in verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken Come upon me. This verse right here is probably the saddest verse in the entire chapter. Simon the Great has heard the gospel. 
He's seen what the Holy Ghost can do in the lives of people. He's seen the authentic power of God and he knew it was different than his fake deceitful power. And he offers money for it and Simon Peter says no. And Simon Peter says, listen, repent. And Simon the Great has a choice to make. Like all of us do when we're confronted with the truth. Do I repent? Do I turn from my way? Or do I stay inside of my own thoughts and my own belief and my own way? Do I take God's way or do I take a counterfeit way? And Simon the Great, well known, famous, lauded, adored, says this to Simon Peter. Simon Peter, would you, would you pray for me? Now, at first glance, this seems like it could be a good thing. Often, I'll have people ask me to pray for them. And I do. And I've asked you to pray for me and others, and, and you do. So, what's going on? Well, look at this again and see what he says. Pray for me. Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. Here's the last truth this morning. We must seek forgiveness, not just relief. You know what Simon asked for? He said, listen, Simon Peter, would you pray for me that nothing bad happens to me? Would you, would you ask God just to keep back the consequences I'm not going to change. That's what he's saying. I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to turn back toward God, but I really don't want to suffer. I really want to have my cake and eat it too. I really want to live life my own way and have a really good ending in life. I want to do things the way I want to do things, and I don't like what you're saying. So just pray to, to the Lord for me, to your Lord for me, and just Make sure that you ask him that these bad things, they just won't happen to me. What a travesty. What a travesty when we try to do things our own way and then ask God to withhold his way. There is a way to find peace and joy and comfort and everlasting life. And there's a way to find corruption and death and they're not the same way. And my friends, they'll never cross. They will never cross. If you live life God's way, you won't face corruption. And if you live life your own way, you won't reap eternal life. They never cross. And yet what Simon asks for is forgiveness. Simon the Great asked for forgiveness, not relief. Christians, as we close this morning, I want you to think this morning about this particular thought. Because unfortunately, the lie is still the same for us today. The lie comes slightly differently because once you're saved, you cannot lose eternal life, but you'll have someone who struggles with bitterness, unforgiveness. They were hurt by someone, maybe hurt by someone at church, and they don't want to deal with it. They want to hold on to that hurt. And there's genuine, sometimes genuine hurt, genuine hardship of which I am incredibly sorry for. But when you approach them, listen, you need to get this right. You know what their response is? Pastor, pray for me. Not to get over bitterness, but that they won't reap what God says bitterness will follow, which is fornication and strife and affect everyone else around them. They don't really want to get right. They just don't want to reap the consequences. We have it with those who who want to raise or deal with their, with their covetousness. We know that wanting everything is not right. But rather than follow God's way to learn to be content, well, pastor, pray for me that I'll want less. Listen, we cannot just say, you know, someone pray that I don't get the consequences, I don't get the, the bad things, and not change our way. This is what Simon the Sorcerer did. I don't want to change my lying and deceit. I was principal for 12 years. I've told you that many times. And we used to tell the students this. Listen, be nice to me because someday you'll need me. And you will never know when you need me, but you will need me. We feel it in the office many calls over the years to students who all of a sudden needed the principal. 
I remember one in particular where a young man was standing in front of his recruiter, his army, I believe it was an army, army recruiter, and he needed some documents right then in order to get into, in order to be able to fill, fully enlist. And guess we had to call? Conversations always went like this. Hey, Pastor Howell, how are you doing? Listen, last time we left, you were saying what a deadbeat I was, so how are we doing? Follow with this second question, how was the school? <laughs> last time you tried to blow up the school. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> you don't care about this. I follow this question, I answer those, and I'd say this, what do you need? Well, you know, I, you know, I mean, don't want to bother you. <laughs> you already have. No, no, no. <laughs> can I get my transcripts? We can do that when you need them. Well, I'm standing in front of my recruiter right now. I'll tell, you right, I'll tell you right now, I have the flesh just like you. There are things I wanted to say right then, that conversation. But, of course, we do our best to be kind and compassionate and follow God's way. We send on the transcripts. I remember another one. A young man came in and said, Pastor, Pastor Howell, will you, will you write a letter for me? You know, after the, after the how are you doing, how's the school thing? I said, well, what, what, what are we asking about? Well, you know, and, and this particular young man over the years, years ago now, had been kicked out of school. He's like, I'm going to see the judge tomorrow. I'm about to be sentenced for, and he mentioned his, the crimes he committed. He said, I'm hoping that if you write a letter for me that maybe it'll, it'll lessen, lessen the sentence. You know what that is? It's Simon the Sorcerer. It wasn't, hey, pastor, can we open up the Bible and can we kind of see what, what God says about my life? It wasn't, how can I change and please God with my way? I want his way instead of my way. It was, hey, can you help lessen the consequences in life? And I wish that all of us were not guilty one time or another of that, but we all are. Are we not? And it goes no further than getting pulled over by a police officer. And as they walk up to the car, you, you've prayed before, haven't you? Lord, help me not to get a ticket. It's not, Lord, help me to to follow the speed limit. Lord, I'm going to follow your way. Lord, help me not to have the consequences. Understand, we must seek forgiveness, not just relief. You know when forgiveness comes? When we repent. If we confess our sins, when we identify them like God identifies them, this is David after he sinned with Bathsheba. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. God, I've done this not just to relieve the consequences, but God, I have hurt you. I've hurt your way. I've gone against you. I've not followed your path with my finances, with my kids, whatever it may be. In each of these situations, we don't want the consequences just like Simon. And yet God is anxious for us to turn back. Yet too often... We only seek relief from punishment rather than freedom from sin. You see, head knowledge is a dead knowledge, but you can turn back. But make sure that you seek forgiveness, not just relief. This morning, maybe you need to truly be saved. Maybe you have a head knowledge, but you've never truly in your heart. And, and the Bible speaks to that end that, that we can truly trust Christ and that our spirit will bear witness. And maybe this morning you need a heart change. But maybe this morning you have had forgiveness of sins, but you've been trying to live life your own way. And you've been trying to circumvent the power of God and try to do things your own way and spend life with your own money thinking you'll get what God has. And you won't get it. So turn back, and you'll find forgiveness. And you'll find out that when you go with God's way, he does amazing things. Because the chapter ends with a eunuch from Ethiopia who's riding along in a chariot. And with his true heart toward God, God sends Philip the evangelist to meet him. And you find out that the words are spoken are God's words. And this man believes and gets baptized, but it's genuine. And because of that, the testimony is eternal.